We continue with our top story closing arguments today in Donald Trump's hush money case. Uh, really, we have been monitoring this all day in anticipation of these closing arguments. The defense immediately attacked Michael Cohen's credibility, and since the prosecution has the burden of proof, it delivered its summation last. Joining me now for some analysis, we have Jeremy Saland, former assistant district attorney, and Cheryl Bader, associate professor at Fordham University School of Law. So thank you both so much for being here. Welcome. It's nice to be here. Jeremy, we've had you on a bunch here. Uh, closing arguments, of course, attacking Michael Cohen quite a bit. What is your overall take of how the defense did? You know, they worked with what they had, and you only can do with what you have. And I thought they did a good job, but I think that that Blanche oversold a little bit. So, for example, out of the gate, he came after Michael Cohen, which he should, because he wants to make it about Michael Cohen. But basically that you're entitled to and you deserve more than what Michael Cohen provided you. And what he did is open the door, unfortunately, I think, for the defense, because the prosecution is going to turn around and say, that's quite true. You do deserve more. And in fact, you heard from Pecker. You heard from Hope Hicks. Mm. You saw uh, handwritten notes from, uh, from Weisselberg. There were call logs. There was so much evidence, so it's not on the shoulders of Michael Cohen. And whether or not you think he's a good guy, whether or not you'd want him to be dating your sister or your next door neighbor is irrelevant. He came and he told the truth, and he ain't no Sammy the Bull. He's a person who will tell you what's going on. And Cheryl, I'm curious, you know, we continue to hear lines from Trump himself, from also his his attorneys, including Tom Blanche today, talking about how, listen, a campaign, yeah, you're trying to influence an election. In fact, one quote for today, every campaign in this country is a conspiracy to promote a candidate, a group of people working together to help somebody win, uh, basically saying that that is not unlawful. What do you make of that argument in this case? So, of course, any candidate is trying to influence an election, but here, the falsified records they have to be in connection with some election fraud, right? The prosecutor otherwise would be charging a misdemeanor instead of a felony. To, so to elevate it, Trump has to actually have the intent right, to conceal or commit another crime, and that crime has to do with the election. Mm -hmm. And so that is a hurdle for the prosecution. And they haven't, during the course of the trial, really specified exactly what that law is. Right. And so here, it's the summation is that opportunity for them to really put all the pieces of the puzzle together, connect the dots to make that picture of why this does actually constitute a felony. And, and Jeremy, you know, the DA's office and, pro and the prosecution has been kind of criticized for that, that very point that Cheryl just made, not really saying what this is, leaving it kind of up to the jury to figure it out. How difficult of a burden is that? Well, they, they're allowed to do that. So they don't have to say it's this particular election crime or a tax crime and have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. That's not what the law requires. It's far more open than that. It's not an extra element. It's not a charge defense. So it, theoretically, it allows one juror to think that this is the crime that was intended to be committed and three other jurors to think something else. And then, you know, another six or seven, whatever, you know, we have to get to 12, obviously, jurors think something different and it's separate. So they don't have to specify which, they don't have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. That's just the elevating factor. Mm -hmm. And I think the evidence went in fairly well. And Cheryl, part of that is going to be these instructions to the jury, making sure they understand how critical is that going to be? It's absolutely critical. And just as you say, right here, they, they don't have to prove, the prosecutor doesn't have to prove the underlying crime. But think about it. The jurors go into that deliberation room. They've heard the instructions. And now they say, oh, OK, so now what do we do? Right? The prosecutor has to give that roadmap to the jury. And the roadmap has to include by right, putting together the pieces of the law into the evidence, because otherwise the jurors are thinking, well, I'm confused, I'm unsure, and that uncertainty might translate into reasonable doubt. And just in our final couple moments here, Jeremy and really Cheryl to both of you as well, uh, we have basically three outcomes, right? <laughs> He's not guilty. He's guilty. Or perhaps there is a hung jury. You think all of these kind of a success to Trump, or at least the way that he poses it in the election? I, I, I don't think he gets, I don't see an acquittal. I, I really don't see an acquittal. Does that mean I see a conviction? Not necessarily. But the hung jury is certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. A hung jury would allow, theoretically, the prosecution to bring it again. But to me, that's a win for Donald Trump. Uh, unless there is a conviction and it's a felony conviction, it's a win for Donald Trump. Yeah, I'm sure that, that Donald Trump will try to turn this around no matter what the result is. But I think the jurors also, they take their responsibility quite seriously. And the judge is going to ask them to go back into that jury room and to try to really reach a verdict. We will all be waiting for the answer there. Good to have you both here. Thank you so Thank much you. for being with us.